Good morning, friends. Stephen Bernoon here with Israeli News Live. And today we're going to be going into a subject from the book of John. Uh, and uh, it's not so much just really inspired because of Tovia Singer, but, uh, but I have been asked about uh, Tovia Singer and his insights and of course, quite frankly, how he obliterates most Christians because you just, I have to say, most of these Christians that come up against Tovia wanting to put Tovia in his place, you don't know what you're doing in the first place. Uh, I have communicated with Tovia over the years, so we're familiar with one another. And, uh, but, but, you know, Tovia is a Orthodox Jewish man. He believes in Noahidism 100%. Uh, and uh, in, unless you really know what you're doing, you're not going to do too well. I can tell you that right now. Jesus, when he said, be wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove, he didn't say it for no reason. And of course, when he dealt with the rabbis of his day, he could put them to silence without any issue whatsoever. So I don't encourage anyone that is trying to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. I'm going to play a little clip here in just a moment for you, but before I do... Uh, we're going to be getting into John chapter 1 here, and we're going to get into this, uh, and I'm going to also be playing a clip from Tovia Singer, uh, where he also is speaking on, uh, hang on, let me find the right place here, yeah, right here in this video here, where he speaks about uh, John, uh, the Gospel of John, and basically calls it idolatry. And, uh, and we're going to correct that. We're going to correct where Tovia is wrong in his uh, analysis on this book here. Uh, but quite frankly, you've got to know what you're doing when you're dealing with someone like Tovia on this subject because he's got in a way to obliterate you very easily unless you are prepared yourself. So we're going to get into that. Uh, we're gonna, but but the thing is though, what I don't want to lose focus on though, is in the Gospel of John, it is much deeper, much more powerful than you could ever even imagine. What John was actually writing here, it's going to take us back to Genesis. It's going to take us to Psalms 42. Uh, I'm sure it could take us to many many other places in the Scripture. But as for now, we're going to be focused on those three right there. And, and I'm going to, I really want to dive into that teaching before we deal with the issue of Tovia's argument. Uh, although I will mention his argument to some degree to start with in the begin, at the beginning of this, because uh, him uh, really going after the Greek word of logos uh, in John chapter 1, where it's translated in from the Greek, it's translated as the word, but it's using the word logos. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Uh, but real quick, let me just show you one thing here. This is where he is dealing with a, uh, obviously, a Christian guy that has come into uh, his synagogue or whatever synagogue he's at there, and he's challenging Tovia. And watch the, just the ability that Tovia has to put this guy to silence that evidently is trying to defend Christianity. But in my opinion, he's just gone about it in the wrong way. Listen in just for a moment here. You're not being honest now. If you have such a fantastic calculation, don't tell me I know it. If I do, no, 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 don't, don't. What is that calculation? I'm listening. Give it to me. What is it? But he told us this week that will pass and will pass till Mashiach will come. Brings us to the year 32. Really? How does that? Please tell me the math. I'm very interested. We have to get aboard. Why at the board? Just give it. And believe me, I'm very familiar with the text. If you just tell me when we start counting, I'll know exactly when do we start counting the 490 years. You tell me. Oh, oh you have it. I, I, I heard of it once in my life, yes. <laughs> what, when do we start counting this? No, no, I'm asking you. You're saying you believe in this faith, and this is the first verse you ever brought up. I asked you a question. I think it's a fair question. Please, Pertel, tell us this calculation. And I asked you the most simplest thing. If it's a 490-year prophecy, please tell me when we start counting. That's a fair question. So please, it's changed your life. Tell me when. I, I say it as a brother. I, I have to ask about that. This is not the point that changed my life. Well, it, it, you can't, you, what you're doing is... When I bring it up, I hear everybody telling me that this is a miscalculation. Please, I'll, I'll, all right, I'll do this. Let's jettison Daniel 9 then, if you say... All right, so we'll pause it there just to kind of give you the idea. The guy's not going to win. 
unless you realize the 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 facts about Artaxerxes, Cyrus, Darius, the different kings that lived during that time, knowing the 490 years, knowing which king it was that, that put forth the decree that Daniel speaks about, uh, and then knowing those time frames and stuff, unless you're really prepared to go into a debate with Tovia Singer, you're not going to come out very well, because this man already knows it too. And even if you did know uh, you take someone like Chuck Missler, the late Chuck Missler. Uh, he would he would know those calculations just off the top of his head. I'd have to go back and review it myself, but I do know that it is based off of the the command to go forth to rebuild the the, the city and uh, and the temple, and it, and that decree. If I'm not mistaken, it was Artaxerxes that actually put out that decree. So you'd have to know that decree there, when it was done, what the year it was done in. And then when you bring it up, yes, it does run in. Uh, it brings us to, to pretty much the time frame that what he is talking about. And then, of course, the Messiah would be cut off in the midst of the week, uh, etc. Uh, but again, without knowing that, you're going to get yourself into a really big fix. And like I said, we're going to be going into John chapter 1 here. Uh, before I do, though, I'm going to play for you a uh, just a, oh gosh, keep doing this wrong here, the short clip here. This is, uh, I want to get this started here. This is where one of his students are asking about John 1 and 1. Uh, and I actually pulled it up because I knew that Tovi had done this already. And I was actually wanting to teach on John 1 and 1. But because so many people are being misled, uh, by Tovia, uh, it is crippling their faith. You're seeing Christians leave Christianity because this man, just like Paul when he was Saul of Tarsus, who was persecuting the church, even unto death, mind you. Now, of course, Paul ended up having an awakening with Christ himself. It took Christ himself to come to deal with this man because he had been taught under the great teacher of Gamaliel, and he was, like Tovia, very, very versed in all that he did and persecuted the church even unto death. As we know, Stephen was killed, and uh, his clothes were laid at his feet there, and he was on his way to Damascus to bring down all of Damascus as well. So Tovia reminds me a lot of the early days Saul. But right now, He's on a campaign that is not very pretty. And the fact that he has 100% for the Noahide laws, which calls for the beheading of Christians, because you believe the Son of Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, you're putting your own self in a very, very dangerous position when you try to tackle this man. Let's listen in. So you needed to have an in-between God who was a trans ascendant God, who's not God, Zeus, Jupiter. Christians come often with the, with the translation of the, of the army, of the army, with the memoir. And they say, ah, oh, the translation, the memoir is like a, like a old, the, the translation make it like your own person. Like a, there's a man, there's a God, there's a spirit, and, and they claim this proof that the, the, the Tabun showed us that there is like a, that the man is like a different, different God or maybe different type, I don't know how to explain. This is the word you will have heard of. You ever heard of the term logos? Lo ah, now everybody heard of it. Logos theology. Logos is very famous because it appears prominently in the first 18 verses of the book of John, which is called the prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Greek word there is logos. What does that mean, the Word? Now, the Aramaic word for this is memro. Memro in Aramaic means a word. What is this word business? What do you and we're going to go into this a little bit later, what Tovia goes in on, on this here. But he's basically going to try to turn you into an idolater because of the word logos uh, or logos. And the thing is, is the, and maybe I should establish this even before we get started uh, into this teaching, because I don't want you to be stumbling around about this to start with. The, we have evidence 
on multiple occasions that a lot of the apostles did actually write in the Hebrew language, spoke in the Hebrew language. It wasn't just all Aramaic. Uh, it wasn't Greek always either um, that was actually being spoke during that time. Uh, now, Tovi is going to talk about Philo and saying Philo for a guy that never that lived in that time period before Jesus was born, and even up to about 50 years after uh, Christ came on the scene there, never mentions Jesus. Well, the thing is, he does. Uh, it's just not in the way that, that most people would think about, and therefore we'll, we'll go into that a little bit as well. But when we look at the different Gospels, like in this case here, we have uh, written on appli.org, though no copies are uh, extant, let's see, uh, the Gospels of Matthew was first written in Hebrew. It says here, the, the, uh, though no copies are extant, there is good historical evidence that Matthew's gospel was first written in Hebrew from around 130 AD. Church father Papias, a former student of, of the Apostle John, explained, so then Matthew wrote the oracles in Hebrew language and everyone interpreted them as he was able. Uh, that was recorded by Eusebius in the Church History 339. Uh, Arrhenius was a student of uh, Polycarp, who was a student of the Apostle John around 170 AD. Arrhenius confirms and elaborates uh, upon Papias' report, says Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, while Peter and Paul were preaching in Rome and laying the foundation of the church. After their departure, Mark, the disciple, the interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Uh, Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. Afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who also had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence in Ephesus in Asia. Now, when he mentions about John, he doesn't really mention, did John actually write a book in Hebrew or did he not? Uh, he doesn't actually uh, mention that part there. We're going to double back to John, though, in just a moment, though. Uh, this here on Cold Case Christianity, John may have been educated after all, because see, some people think that John had no ability to write. All right, don't be too quick to dismiss John as uneducated. Now, I, I actually bring this one out for a reason, too. Hebrew children were required to memorize the first five books of the Torah before they were 12, 12 years old. Young students were also required to discuss these texts and write them. There is good reason to believe that John and James were not exempt from this requirement. In fact, the internal evidence from the gospel suggests John and James were more than familiar with the rabbis and Jewish teachers of their day. Take, for example, this description of Jesus' arrest and arrival at the residence of Ananus, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. We're going to read that in just a moment, but keep in mind, notice, John and James, now they were brothers, the sons of Zebedee, right? And as he brings out, they may have been, you know, fishermen, but they no doubt were educated at least in Torah, which would be Hebrew script. Now, I'm going to double over to James real quick. This is one of these documents from the Nag Hammadi writings, but the reason only I bring this out is for historical purposes only. All right, only historical purposes. The documents were discovered in 1947. This is Codexus uh, 1. It was translated by Francis E. Williams. And uh, it is a book uh, allegedly written by James. I do not know if that is really true or not. But the, the importance of this here is we do have these books dated to around the second century. All right. Since you asked that I send you a secret book which was revealed to me and Peter by the Lord, I could not turn you away or gainsay you. But I have written it in the Hebrew alphabet. There you go right there. So James wrote in the Hebrew alphabet as well. We also can look at Paul here. But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus in a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee suffer me to speak unto the people. When he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. When there was a made a great silence, he spoke unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and then he goes on to speak what he's going to say. So Paul spoke in Hebrew to the Jewish people. We see that James wrote to the apostles in the Hebrew 
uh, tongue uh, or in the Hebrew letters as well. We find we know that James and John were brothers, so obviously they both had learned to read and write in the Hebrew language. And if that were not the only thing there, then we have Nehemiah Gordon. Nehemiah Gordon discovers in what they call the Vatican junk box this one page. One page only. It was from a microfiche, and on his wall you can see the original that they have there. This is from the Vatican's archives there. They had taken uh, photographs of different ancient Hebrew manuscripts, and the Vatican had this one in their own possession here, and this is John chapter 1. Uh, ver in fact, it's literally uh, not only just John chapter 1, but it is uh, well, chapter 1, but it is the the very verses that we're going to be speaking about today. Uh, and so now Nehemiah will tell you, we have no way of knowing, was this an original? Was this taken from an original? But obviously when you see here, John's book was actually written in the Hebrew language and the question would have to be for what reason? I would have to say that the document is at least, uh, could not be earlier written maybe than the third uh, century. So it is a copy. We know that because it is using the vowel points that did not get introduced until about the second century to begin with. So even if it is taken from one of John's earlier writings, it would be a copy of one of his writings uh, of his gospel, the gospel of John, because like I said, they have the vowel points inserted in here. So somewhere along the way, we have that on there. And Nehemiah, like he says, he doesn't know, but it's still a treasure trove to find that document. So there we have it there. Uh, we, we know that Paul, James, and Matthew, for a fact, were involved in the Hebrew language uh, during that time period. So, and they used the Hebrew language according to what we have written there. And again, we have this first chapter, and we're going to be referring to that. And the reason why I bring this up, though, is because, remember, Tovia Singer, he's bringing up the word logos, uh, the Greek word logos. And he's going to uh, use this because Philo, uh, the great, uh, the great uh, contemporary writer Philo, that, of course, he claims Jesus never spoke about or anything like, or excuse me, that, Jesus, that Philo never wrote about Jesus, uh, that he actually, in his own writings there, cites the Targum, uh, you know, which was the Greek version of the Bible at that time, and uh, uses the word logos in place of the, wor the, the quote, word. Or in Hebrew, as we say, the word is davar. Davar. Davar is actually what is used there. Now, the beautiful part about this is, though, is in the Hebrew manuscript that we have, when it says, Ba'ashit haya hadavar, hadavar, ve hadavar haya etel ha Elohim. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with or next to God. Etzel, etzel means uh, next to, is what it literally means. Uh, so, the, so the, the argument right now, from the very beginning, is uh, the reason why I'm bringing this out, is because. Well, I'm bringing this out because there's something that's very important in the book of John that we're going to learn today. That's the most important part. But when you're dealing with Tovia Singer, he's going to take you into Logos and try to rip you to shreds that you believe in pagan gods like Zeus and everything else. As a result, claiming that the word Devar is the real word for the word word in Hebrew. And it is. I'm not taking away from that part there. But the thing is, is what Tovia doesn't want you to know is that we have a Hebrew manuscript of the book of John, and it did use the word devar to begin with. Um, so regardless of which way we take this in the Greek, it doesn't matter because the Greek would still mean the same thing as what the Hebrew document stated from the beginning. Uh, no pun intended on that. All right, so let's get started. Though. I really want to get into this here because, like I said, it's a beautiful, beautiful chapter. I'm going to take you to the English version right here. We're going to look at this a little bit. Uh, we're going to start off right here because, like I said, this is very deep. It's very beautiful, and you need to know more about what's said here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and we have on here, and the Word was God. Uh, 
The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, I think Zoe is what they use in the Greek there for the word life. But what was important to me is what was used in Hebrew. Okay, and in Hebrew, when we get down here to that point right there, uh, in him was the life. Let me find it in the text here real quick. Right here. I can't highlight it like, like Nehemiah can when we go to let him. I'm going to have him read some of this himself. Okay. Mikor ha'ashar haya bo hayu ha'chaim ve'chaim. Okay. In him... It was the life, hachaim, and then he says, hayu or, okay, hayu ha or ha'anashim. Now, I think uh, Nehemiah is going to translate that as men, and the, and the life was the light of men, but anashim is easily translated as mankind or humans or people, in other words, so it's not gender inclusive excuse me, gender exclusive is gender inclusive, includes both men and women as well. So that life that was in him, which is from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, he, because, because Christ is the tree of life, the Eitz Chaim. And remember, when he came to redeem his own, he, he breathed on them, uh, like we see in Genesis there. And let me just take you real quick there. Um, This is when he's creating Adam and Eve. <clears throat> he breathes on them the breath of life. Uh, that, and what's important, too, is that... Let me just find that right place. Here we go, right here. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. All right? The breath of life. There is there it is right there, the Chaim. Just what we saw... <clears throat> Over in the book of John, all right? Ipak bepa'av nishmar chayim. He breathes into him the breath of life into his nostrils, that life. <clears throat> now Adam, though, ve'yahi ha'adam lenefesh chaya. All right, he gets his a singular for him. When it speaks of him, it's singular. All right, he's not in the plural. He's in the singular because he's an individual per person. But God puts a plural form of that life in him because why? Eve is already inside of him as well. <clears throat> so that's kind of important to kind of note there. Now, one thing though too, and I need to go ahead and start, we're going to kind of start this right now so you kind of capture this because I think it's very important. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now the earth was unformed and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the, the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and morning one day. All right? You need to really hold that in your mind. Now, Tovi, even in that video, just for so you're aware of this, he's going to say that um, Christians always are, no, I think he said atheists made fun of them, uh, saying that Jews didn't know what they were talking about because the sun is created on the fourth day, but yet the light is brought in on the first day. There's no sun. How can there be light? Well, that's a very good argument, though, in a way. And even though Tovia tries to explain it out, uh, through a scientific method, it actually has nothing to do with even his scientific method. That light is a different kind of light to begin with. Because as John brings out, it is in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. So he's still referring to Genesis. In him was Chaim, life. And the life was what? The light of men. So the light that we're reading about in Genesis on day one is really not the same light that you're reading about on day four. And the light shine, shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, literally, in the Hebrew, the, uh, the when the light shined, the darkness could not contain it. 
In other words, they were living in vessels that had no ability to hold such great light that was brought unto them. And when we read over here in Genesis, there let there be light. There, see now. The, oh, wait a minute. Now the earth was unformed and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The tachum. Tachum. Darkness was on the face of the deep. The choshek. See the haaras hayata tohu vevochu vechoshek. And darkness, alpane tachum, was upon the face, literally the face of the deep. That's literally written symbolically. Now, of course, Natovia would probably want to have a field day with me on that. He wouldn't like that either. But it actually is symbolically. And we can see that because we're going to look at that with David in the Psalms, where David speaks about it over here, where he says, deep calleth unto the deep. Tahum, notice that word, Tahum el Tahum kore. Deep, unto the deep calls out. Le kol tsanorecha, at the voice. Now they translate it here, cataracts or a water spout. It's kind of like an opening up type of thing, is what that really is. All thy waves, thy billows are gone over me. Isn't that interesting? The verbiage that David used, the deep is calling unto the deep, but yet he's talking about at the voice of thy cataract or the voice of thy water spout. In other words, what does a water spout do? It opens up an area down into the depths because the waves and the billows are gone over him. He's giving you a, a beautiful analogy of Genesis. Now the earth was unformed and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Again, Genesis and Baashit and what, what Moses write here, writes here, that God hovered over the face of the waters. David is writing that there's, there's, there is water, billows have flowed over, and yet the deep is calling unto the deep. If you look at Psalm uh, 42 and you go back at the beginning, what does he say? This is for the leader of Michelle, the sons of Korah. You know, Korah and Dathan are the ones that withstood Moses. As the heart painteth after the water brook, so painteth my soul after you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say unto me all day, Where is your God? These things I remembered and pour out of my soul within me. How I passed on the throng and led them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise of multitude, keeping, the, uh, keeping holy day. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Notice that why the soul is cast down. Why moanest you within me? Hope you in God, for I shall yet praise him for the salvation of his countenance. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore do I remember you from the land of Jordan and Hermons and from the hill of Mizar. Deep calls into the deep and the voice of thy cataracts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. By day the Lord will command his loving kindness, and the night his song shall be with me. Even a prayer unto the God of my life, I will say unto God my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning under the oppression of the enemy? As with crushing in my bones, mine adversaries taunt me, while they say unto me all the day, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? David, no doubt, like the 90 and 9, but the one sheep that went astray, was like the one sheep that went astray. But the waves and the billows had gone over him. Tachum el tachum koe. The deep was calling unto the deep. All right. So, but the thing is, is he's also talking about. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Okay? 
Why I go a mourning under the oppression of thy enemy? But God has not forgotten. In John, we read it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was Chaim, the life, and the life was the light of men. As we see over here, when God first breathed into Adam, he breathed into him the Chaim. And what happened? He became a living soul. But when God first came down, he had what? He had Genesis. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. If we were to take that, that's, that's being fulfilled right here in John, because now John is speaking about in the beginning. And John is saying, for people like Tovia Singer that don't believe it, Bereshit haya hadavar, excuse me, hadavar vehadavar haya etzer ha'elohim. Ha'elohim hu haya hadavar zehayad bereshit etzer ha'elohim. So it was the Devar, it was the Word, it was the Word of Almighty God that was there in the beginning, and that Word was next to God, or with God, and God, He uh, uh, will, let's see, the Word in the beginning was, uh, was, was, next, to, was, was next to Him with God, all right? Now, the point is, and I'm trying to do this fast, I'm making a mess of it, let me slow down here. The same was in the beginning with God, right? That's, that's why I was trying to translate it like that. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay? There we go right here. Lo say. And the life was the light of mankind. I'm fixing to have Nehemiah do the translations on this as we go because I want to focus on some things here that he says here. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And that's why we're going to really get Nehemiah involved in this a little bit. Let, let me, let, let's go into, let's just play some of this. Let me find out where we are in this part here. Let me, <laughs> uh, back up to about right here. Kol hadvarim ne'asubo u'mibaladav lo ne'asad davar mikol asher haya All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made from all that was. Bo hayu hachayim, in him was life. Vahachayim hayu or haanashim, and life was the light of men. Vahaol haya zorech baafelot, baafelot lo hechiluhu. And the light was shining forth in the darkness, and the darkness could not contain it. There you go. The darkness could not contain it. Okay. Vahafelot, vahafelot lo. Uh, they couldn't contain it. See, darkness has no ability to... In other words, when we talk about darkness, you got to remember, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they talk about the sons of light and the sons of darkness. The sons of darkness are those souls that are here on this earth that never came by the will of God. And so they're never going to be able to contain that kind of light. Because remember, as John says here, that life was the light of men. In the beginning, it was breathed into Adam. When Jesus came after his crucifixion and resurrection, the scripture says he breathed upon them and said, Receive ye the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
That was the life, because why? He was the tree of life. Okay, let's continue. Meaning the light. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain man sent from God, and his name was Yochanan. That's Hebrew for John. And it goes on and it says, This one came in testimony to testify concerning the light in order that they would believe everything because of him. He was not the light, but only testifying concerning the light, meaning John. Mm -hmm. It was true light, to shed light on every man who enters into this world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not recognize him. Uh, he came to his true homeland or birthplace, and the children of his house did not accept him. Now that was very confusing for Nehemiah when he says he came to his true birthplace, and they did not accept him. You remember how the scripture talks about Jesus being the second Adam? I believe it's more of that thought in itself is why it says he came to his true birthplace. Because in maybe in Nehemiah's mind, he's trying to fathom that because he seems to be a little bit perplexed about that. Um, you know, it's almost as to say, you know, wait a minute, he, he was just being born. How could he be coming to his true birthplace uh, if he's just now being born? And so there again, that, that is a, that's open to interpretation without a, without a doubt. When we read that, let me go over here to the uh, uh, Greek Matthew, that we, or Greek John we have. There's a true light, lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Um now see, that's where we get it there. We get it a little bit worded differently in the Greek. That's one reason why we know, too, that this Hebrew Matthew that Nehemiah has is definitely not the same as the uh, Greek version that we have. So that's what indicates to us that this may really be from one of the original documents because there is slightly, slightly variations of the way it's worded. But as many as received him... To, him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's the most important part that I wanted you to understand, and we're going to come to that in just a moment, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. How do you become to become born by the will of God? Well, that goes back to where Jesus, when it says here, and I'll pull this up real quick. John 20 and 22 is where it's at. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. By the way, I think there's some little bit more to that too uh, than what meets the eye. Uh, whoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. In other words, if they receive and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, their sins are remitted and they're able to receive the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. If they do not have that ability and they are truly in that darkness, then their sins are retained automatically. And I think that's exactly what he's talking about. But he breathed on them and said to them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, right? That still comes back to what we have in Genesis 2. All right, we're, we're in the beginning. It says, He breathed on them the what? The chayim, the life. 
And that's exactly what John gave and what or what, what we have in the Hebrew version of this here, the Chaim. But that Chaim is the light of men. And that's what makes you a son and daughter of God is that light that God gave or the light of mankind, Ha'anashim. All right, that's what that is there. Okay, so... Let me let me let's just real quick finish with Nehemiah real quick and then we'll continue on. And to all those who accepted him and believe in his name, he gave dominion that they would be sons of Elohim. That's important as well. Uh, Bishmo in his name, right there on the bottom line, right there, uh, next to the bottom. Natan um uh, excuse me. He gave them, literally that word that is used there is, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a divine providence. It's a command. It's like a military, a governmental type of thing. He has given you that ability to become the sons of the living God. The reason why this is so important to me for you is that when you are truly filled with the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said, the works that I do, you will do also. Greater than this, because I go unto the Father. So being able to walk on water, if you have a need of, is there. Uh, raising the dead, opening the eyes of the blind. Uh, like Philip, able to travel from one place to another, even without an automobile, but yet within a matter of minutes, be at another location. Uh you know, we could we could go on and on and on about the different things that you get because he's literally given you that ability to become the true, the B'nai Ha'elohim, the true sons of the living God is what he's giving you. Let's continue on here. Asher heim lo midam velo michefetz habasar adam. Yeah, that's important as well. Asher heim lo... Uh, it's hard for me to see what's on here. Miram velo mechafetz. Which what he's saying is that they're, that you're not that they're not being born of flesh. They're not being born by the will of man. In other words, it's not a sexual birth. This is by uh, the will of God. Listen on. Uh, for they were not born out of blood and not out of the desire of flesh. Velo mechafetz adam no ladu. Not out of the right. desire of men, but from Elohim. And then it ends. <laughs> right. Because when you're being born by God, that's where when Christ breathes on you, the Holy Spirit, you are now being born by the will of God. Now, this particular, like Nehemiah said, this particular document ends right there. It goes to another page where he, he points out the reason why you know this is because of the fact that there's another letter showing there was another page, but that was the only page that the Vatican was in the Vatican junk box of what he shows there. And again, the important thing about this too is the fact that where Tovia argues that Logos used in the Greek uh, version of John, he wants to make it look like we're following uh, John as an idolater, which, whereas John clearly wrote the word Hadavad to start with. Makes no difference how I got translated into Greek. And, uh, and I still think that there was nothing wrong with the word logos. Uh, as we know, Philo clearly brought out uh, that it was in the Targum. And, uh, but, but Tovia wants to argue that, that, that Philo didn't even know Jesus or anything. Let me real quick, uh, pretty much in closing here, I want to share with you what this uh, gentleman put together on Philo. So I thought it was very interesting uh, that uh, seems to clearly indicate that Philo did know who Jesus was. But no doubt because of his day and the fear of what uh, could happen to him for following Jesus, he used a different method of describing him. Listen to this. It contains similar versions of the line, Here is the man whose name is East. The similarity is not immediately obvious in English translations because the same Greek word Anatoly is translated as East in Philo's work and Branch in Zechariah. This is the passage from Philo. For there is a twofold kind of dawning in the soul, the one of a better sort, the other of a worse. That is the better sort when the light of virtue shines forth like the beams of the sun, and that is the worse kind when they are overshadowed and the vices show forth. Now the following is an example of the former kind. 
and God planted a paradise in Eden towards the east, not of terrestrial but of celestial plants, which the planter caused to spring up from the incorporeal light which exists around him. I have also heard one of the companions of Moses having uttered such a speech as this, Behold, a man whose name is the East. A very novel appellation indeed if you consider it as spoken of a man who is composed of body and soul, but if you look upon it as applied to that incorporeal being who in no respect differs from the divine image, you will then agree that the name of the East has been given to him with great felicity. For the father of the universe has caused him to spring up as the eastern son, whom, in another passage, he calls son. the firstborn. And he who is thus born, imitating the ways of his father, has formed such and such species, looking to his archetypal patterns. I have to tell you, you when I listen to what he wrote here, Philo, what he writes here, he is so clearly even identifying the very things that we're talking about now. Uh, using the word sun and talking about the type of light that existed at that time. Um, and, you know, because a man whose name is the East, a very novel appellation indeed, if you consider it as spoken of a man who is compounded of a body and soul, but if you look upon it as, a, as applied to the incorporeal being, who in no respects differs from the divine image. See, he was what? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. You will then agree that the name of the East has been given to him with great felicity. For the father of the universe has caused him to spring up as the eldest son, whom in another passage he calls the firstborn. And tell me he's not talking about Jesus. Now he's going to also show you in the book of Zechariah where it, Zechariah refers and here's to Jesus as the branch. Six. And the word of the Lord came to me. Take from the exiles Heldiah, Tobijah, and Jediah who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold, and make a crown, and set it upon the head of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall grow up in his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. And there again, if you're trying to deal with Tovia Singer on something like this, he's going to take it more in a literal sense. And it's not a literal sense because the temple of the Lord that is going to be built up, although no doubt that they were building of the temple during that time as well, but it is a prophecy. The name is the branch. We know that branches refers to Jesus. You know, this was the fact that he was going to build the true temple of God and we are that temple. So keep in mind, Tovia is, is not... Tovia is going to be more realist in nature based on Old Testament theology. As he would say, Torah, Tanakh, however you want to bring this out, that's the way he's going to do it. You're, you're just, you're barking up the wrong tree to even try to debate, the, to debate this man or to listen to him. And because he's got a carnal way of thinking, you're never going to get the true insights of the Word of God from him. But if anything, he will cause your faith to stagger and waver. And after all, John is one of the most beautiful books you could ever imagine. We're not born of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. In other words, you have, you have received the life that was in him, and that life was the light of men. There was a true light which giveth light, lighteth every man that cometh into the world. But it won't be the ones that are born that other way. And I hope as deep as this message is, short to the point, well, it's not really short, but to some degree, I hope it will help you. And if God lays upon your heart to support the work we do, we certainly appreciate it. Our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. And you can contribute either online by clicking that button there or to Danoon Institute, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. Uh, by the way, that is a very interesting video right there where you can see uh, Brian on there in the screen there. Actually, Cindy said he was going to watch it. I haven't heard back from him as of yet, but I am beginning to wonder what the real agenda is on that end. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Thank you for listening and God bless you.